When I started as the grouse biologist in 2011, I started to hear from hunters that grouse were in trouble. They were in good habitat, but good habitat was sort of sitting empty. You know, we always attribute grouse declines to habitat, but started to wonder if there might be issues beyond just habitat involved. So I looked back at the data that we have on grouse populations, and I saw that between 2002 and 2005, there was this statewide crash in the population. Our actual grouse harvest declined 63%, so a, a big, steep decline that occurred across the whole state. And when something happens that dramatically and that suddenly in a state as big as Pennsylvania, it makes you realize that there's something more than just habitat going on. That really has the fingerprints of a disease. I started to look through the literature at what disease issues had happened in Pennsylvania in the early 2000s, and West Nile virus immediately jumped out as a possibility. So I did some research and found that West Nile virus has been very deadly to sage grouse out west, but nobody really knew if it affected rough grouse or not. The first question was to figure out if grouse even get it. Wild turkey don't seem to get it very frequently. Um, chickens, pheasants don't seem to have a problem with it, and they're all in the same family as grouse. So the question then was, if they're exposed to West Nile, does it cause a problem or not? In order to do that, we had to set up a laboratory study where we got grouse that had never been exposed to the disease and then inoculate them with the disease and see if it impacts them. The challenge is to try to find Pennsylvania grouse that have never been bitten by a mosquito, you know, have never been exposed. So the way to do that was to find them while they're still in the egg. So the first part of the study was really this statewide nest search where I asked people to keep their eyes out for grouse nests. And it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, but I talked to about 3,000 people so everybody knew that we were looking for nests, and as they found a nest, they would call me, and I would go out and assess and see whether it was suitable to pick up those eggs. When a nest was found, I would usually go in and pick up every egg. Uh, I didn't want to leave a partial clutch behind, because if I left two or three eggs in the nest, first of all, I might have led a predator right to that nest. And then secondly, she would stay on that nest and hatch two or three chicks. If I take all the eggs, she'll relay an entire clutch, and so she'll be back up to a complement of 10, 11, or 12 eggs. So I would find a nest, I would take all the eggs, and then put them in safe storage. And at that point then, we actually were shipping eggs to our propagator in Idaho on UPS trucks. So it was kind of bizarre. There was a lot of foam packaging involved to get these fragile eggs on a truck safely to Idaho. As the season progressed, when the hens started sitting on the eggs, I was taking them and putting them right into an incubator because they couldn't be allowed to chill. At that point, we had to get warm eggs to Idaho, and we had a volunteer, Tim Flanagan. He and his wife volunteered to drive those eggs across country to meet up with our farmer in Idaho. So just getting the chicks safely to Idaho was a huge undertaking of the project. Once they were in Idaho, the propagator has a quarantine facility that he could ensure no mosquitoes were getting in there. He hatched the eggs, raised the chicks to about four to six weeks of age, and then he drove them to Colorado where the lab sits. Once they got to the lab in Colorado, they were allowed to settle in for a few days, and then at that point they were inoculated with West Nile virus and then observations and blood sampling was taken you know, every day beyond that point. 40% of the chicks died in that first week as a direct result of West Nile virus. After the challenge study, the lab looked at the chicks that had survived the really acute phase of West Nile virus. So these birds had survived for two weeks total length. When they opened those chicks up, they found that all but one of them had severe or moderate organ damage that probably would not have allowed them to survive in the wild. So at the end of that study, we found that 10% of the exposed chicks may have had a chance of surviving in the wild. 
The Rough Grouse Society first became aware of the connection between West Nile virus and rough grouse through Lisa Williams from the Pennsylvania Game Commission. What we find from that study is going to give us information for rough grouse populations all over the country. Pennsylvania is really blessed to have a large number of very passionate grouse hunters. So just to put in perspective how important the hunters are in this study, if I were to try to go out and trap grouse, the average effort required in Pennsylvania is 50 to 60 trap days per grouse. So literally, I may spend 50 or 60 days trying to get my hands on one grouse. where these grouse cooperators provide data that I could never get on my own. In a typical year, I hear from 200 hunters that have kept a diary for me, and that represents six or 7,000 hours of active searching for grouse because they're out there with their dogs going through cover very carefully. It's the type of data that we could never ever get with just state staff or even bird watching volunteers. This is an active survey. It's a very efficient survey and it gives the amount of data that you have to have in order to really know what's happening with the population. Uh, today we're in uh, north central Pennsylvania hunting rough grouse. We're helping Lisa Williams, a rough grouse biologist. We've been sending blood samples to her all year and the blood study is used to look at the effects of West Nile virus in the population. I always respect hunters who are in the middle of a hunt, a bird goes up, they shoot, the bird comes down, you know, that's the pinnacle of grouse hunting. And then they stop, take the bird, open it up, and get me a blood sample. And it's amazing to me the, the passion and the commitment that those hunters have to the research, that they would interrupt their grouse hunt to, to get us that information. This whole study of West Nile virus is really intriguing from a biological perspective. From a manager's perspective, I can't wait to get to the point where we know how to fix it, where we know something to do to help grouse. Grouse require active forest management to create that thick, young forest habitat they need. From a personal perspective as a grouse hunter, it's a real kick in the gut. I mean, we are seeing a population crash like we have not seen in a hundred years. From a conservationist perspective, it's very troubling. We know now that many birds are affected by West Nile virus. It's not just grouse. A recent study looked at 49 different songbird species, and they found that half had dramatic response to West Nile virus when it came through. Of those, half had an immediate response and then recovered. The other half are continuing to face population challenges and declines. So we know this disease is impacting our bird population critically for some species. As a conservationist, this wall of incoming disease and invasive species sometimes feels like trying to hold back the ocean. With the support of grouse hunters, we're working hard to come up with answers for how to best manage grouse in light of this new threat. But the more we can learn, the more power we have in trying to moderate and fix the situation.